Alright, hello everyone. Today I'm going to be sharing with you my practice for my presentation that I'm going to be doing at my local aquarium club. And today I'm going to be presenting on temperate and subtropical fish. So these are fish that don't need to be kept with a heater. Um, so but what is a temperate water fish you might ask? A temperate water fish is a fish that is native to an area like our own where it goes through seasons and temperature swings throughout the year. Um, and if you were to be able to see the diagram here, uh, we're going to be focusing today on the um, fish in the yellow and orange bands, which generally, you know, it's subtropical and temperate zones. All right, so. A lot of the subtropical and temperate water fish in the Hami can handle room temperature just fine, which is like 18 to 23 degrees Celsius. And a lot of these fish are advertised as tropicals, and they do really well in a tropical tank, but they can also do really well at room temperature, or even colder in some cases, and um, it can actually benefit them to go through seasonality. Um, you, you can get increased spawning or slow down spawning if that's what you were aiming to do. And uh, it can be really fun to work with these species. So what did I do? I, when I got hooked on temperate water species, mainly goldfish, I decided to take a unfinished section of my basement and set up fish tanks. And it started with one and it slowly moved to nine. <laughs> um, so yeah, I and when I started in the hobby, I always thought that you know people kept small tanks on their bedside dresser or in their living room, and that you know it was always tropical fish. I, I don't think I ever realized that there was temperate water or subtropical fish until I really got deeper into the hobby and I started keeping goldfish and I realized oh they get big tanks and oh keeping them in the basement safer when they're a big tank. So my hobby started moving in a different direction and I just started utilizing space differently. So I built racks, I started stacking tanks, and I put them in the basement. Interesting. Where I went next is probably more interesting. I started keeping fish outdoors, so I started doing what is often called on the internet, summer tubbing. Um, which is honestly probably like one of the most exciting parts of the year for me now. Um, I really enjoyed my first year of summer tubbing. Um, I was able to successfully spawn two species outdoors and that was really fun. And I feel like one of the biggest benefits for a lot of people is that it can be a decorative piece to their yard. For me it's a way to enjoy my fish in a unique and different way um, and have seasonality with my hobby because if my hobby was the same every day every day of the year I would get bored of it and I would set up new tanks or I'd take down old tanks but this way I'm able to move some fish outdoors spend some time with them there maybe neglect them maybe spoil them rotten who knows it is different it's gonna be different every year and I'm gonna work with different species every year I know it so in that way, summer tubbing or outdoor ponds can really reinvigorate your hobby, or at least it did for me. Um, so now another thing what it does that it does is it makes you learn new aspects of the hobby. So generally in the freshwater aquarium keeping hobby, we keep fish in fish tanks and we use filters and we generally overstock. Now when you go and you fill up, say, a 500 gallon pond, you don't exactly want to be doing 50% water changes every week to keep your 100 fish or whatever. Instead what you tend to do is you greatly understock and you get large bodies of water which dilute the pollution and you use plants. And you, you might be saying to yourself, well, I've never grown plants in an aquarium before. It's a lot easier outdoors when you have large pond fish like goldfish that produce a lot of waste and you have unlimited access to CO2, you have incredibly bright light, better, lights, better, better light is created by the sun than anything we can make man-made with a 
with a LED or any other kind of light source that we create artificially. So summer ponds are really cheap. Often pond supplies are built to last 20-ish years. Um, and just in general you're paying like 50 cents per gallon or a dollar per gallon for a lot of the tubs, um, containers, preformed ponds. Pond liner is probably going to be the cheapest way to go if you're willing to dig your own pond. So it's, it's a really cheap avenue to go down. The fish last a long time generally. Now one of the most exciting things that I've probably already touched on is the fact that you can breed fish outdoors and one of the coolest things that I found about breeding fish outdoors was I was able to successfully breed egg scatterers and very very tiny fish that I would generally have to um, cultivate baby brine shrimp. Now in a pond system you're going to get things like Daphnia forming, you're going to get all sorts of algaes, you're going to get mulm buildup, you're going to get food rotting, you're going to get all sorts of like little critters that you can't control and those little critters are what is feeding your baby fish and you can just feed the adults and for the most part the babies have a really high success rate making it. Now depending on what species you're working with maybe you need to put more plants in there to give fry more cover up to you um, but in my experience just with the large body of water the fry were able to escape the parents and I had a, like a higher success rate. So in the image here I have multiple examples of some like true like mini ponds, probably something like, like 150 gallons or less. Um, my favorite is the bottom left image and that's from Kaimuki Backyard which is a YouTube channel. He breeds um, oh, sunset microf guppies in 50 gallon um, like half barrels, maybe they're 25. But the point of the matter is he takes um, rain barrels, cuts them in half, both halves he's filling up with water and breeding guppies in them and he even manages to keep plants in it. He has uh, tropical lilies. Um, he does have an advantage over us in the fact that he uh, lives in Hawaii so he's able to keep the guppies out there a lot of the year. Um, but we also have other examples, so we have the rubber made tote in the top left, um, there's another, there's a whiskey barrel pond there, and then what looks to be just a giant planter pot. So get as creative as you can be, I've seen people use hot, old hot tubs that don't work anymore, I've seen people go full out, spend thousands of dollars, and build themselves a giant koi pond. Whatever is in your price range and what you're looking to do, you do. Me, I was, I was looking to get a couple hundred gallon ponds and just work with smaller species. So now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on when I put the fish out, because that was a big thing for me, like when do I put these fish out? I live in northern Ontario, Canada, where it's cold most of the year, so I found that when I put my temperate water fish out, so that was my minnows and my goldfish, I was able to put them out when the nighttime temperatures were between 10 and 15 degrees, which started about the second week of June. We had a colder summer this year, and it's summer started later. And then I was able to keep those fish outside until about the second week of September. Um, so our summer usually lasts into the end of September, but it ended early as well uh, this year. So that's approximately three months of keeping your temperate water fish outside, which isn't too optimal, but that, again, that's without a heater. If you wanted to extend that at all, you could always use a heater. So these are some images of the fish I kept outside. Um, you got my two common goldfish there, and a bunch of fathead minnows. I think I started with seven if I remember correctly. I put them, all those fathead minnows and the goldfish into a hundred gallon tank with some water hyacinth and giant water lettuce and I decided to put a six inch by six inch by six inch sponge filter in there and run an air pump because I was like 95% certain that those fathead minnows were going to breed because when I put them in there I already had males that were colored up and in their spawning. They were ready to spawn, so it was just a matter of 
picking a cave and having some space. So next, after that, I put my subtropical fish outside. So the sub subtropical species I worked with this summer was the Varios platy. Um, I put them outside during the second week of July. Again, we had a really cold uh, summer, so it wasn't until later during the second week, second week of July where the nighttime temperature was about 15 degrees air temp that I was able to put them outside, and that kind of gave me the assurance that they would be okay if we had a really cold night. Because honestly, their, their tub is going to fluctuate in temperature, but it doesn't fluctuate so much in temperature that it matches the air temperature. It generally floats in between the daytime high and the uh, nighttime low. Um, and when you, oh sorry, and I also kept the platies outside until the last week of August because August was really, really hot for some reason, and then it cooled off really quickly. Um, yeah, so this time frame is going to vary with, for you based on the species you work with. If you want to work with something like I did, where it's only, like, its lowest threshold is 15 degrees, then maybe follow those general guidelines. Um, so, what else? Oh, yeah. So I find a lot of people ask me questions, excuse me, growing outdoor pond plants. So I found out that if you mess around with the fertilizer or you change too much water, you often upset the balance of the pond. So the real key here when growing pond plants during the summer is to just let them be, do the thing. If they're potted plant, fertilize them in the beginning and then once a month put a root tab down there and fertilize them. Um, for floaters and any kind of your like stem plant, leave them be, let the fish waste accumulate and do maybe 10%, 25% water changes uh, like once a month. Don't overdo it because you'll end up upsetting the balance of your pond. It's not like an aquarium. It is something that will actually find balance. Um, so if you're looking for some easy pond plants, here's some ones that I know you'll have success with and you'll have access to. So the first one being a water lily. Um, generally Walmart will have these. So will a lot of the um, garden stores. So you can have your own lily pads in your yard. And they will often bloom, especially if you get ones that are native to the area. If you get uh, more tropical ones, they probably won't bloom for you. I made that mistake myself. But they will still shoot up pads and do quite well. Um, another good one is water hyacinth. That one's super popular with the garden centers, and that's because if you keep it in nice full sunlight and you give it lots of nutrients, it will actually flower for you, and that looks really good. I personally did not end up um, with flowering. I ended up with algae coating them, which was unfortunate. A plant that I didn't do really well for me, though, was water lettuce. And water lettuce likes uh, nice direct uh, sunlight, has super long trailing roots, so it um, provides cover for your fry, and it just propagates really, really quickly. Um, another good one would be hornwort. You can get that from a lot of pet stores. It's in the pet trade. Um, hornwort is actually native to Canada and uh, other areas of North America. And it will actually grow really, really quickly in our warm weather. Just be careful that it doesn't get coated in algae, which tends to happen with mine. Um, so, now we're going to take a look at some of the cooler, or cooler water species that I keep. So, one of the main ones I was putting outside this summer was my common goldfish because I wanted them to gain some size and have some extra space to swim. So, common goldfish can go all the way down to 5 degrees, um, arguably even 4 degrees Celsius, without any issues as long as you give them time to acclimate to it. It isn't just a sudden shock. Um, this is often how you hear about people overwintering goldfish outside in their pond, but you have to keep in mind that there has to be a hole in the ice to gas off. Uh, carbon dioxide and ammonia and you have to have water for it to swim in. So here ice gets about four feet thick at the uh, coldest part of our winter so you'd want to have a pond that's at least six to eight feet deep. Um, I would go with eight just to play it safe. Um, goldfish are super hardy fish and they're great for ponds especially mini ponds or even medium-sized ponds 
but they often grow too large for most people to overwinter them indoors long term because they grow up to a whole foot long. All right, fancy goldfish. These are my favorite. This is what actually gets me super excited for the pond season. Um, so one thing you find out when you're a big fancy goldfish enthusiast is that there's almost like a hierarchy to the breeds. And what we've found over time, I haven't experienced this completely yet, although I do see it from time to time, is that the fancier breeds like Ryukins, Bubble Eyes, um, Tosakins, the, the fancier breeds with uh, more modified bodies often don't do well in the cold and it will upset their swim bladder. So even bringing them down as low as 15 degrees will upset them and give them swimming issues. Meanwhile, fantails and arandas can go down to 10 degrees easily, and some people will argue 5 degrees, but I have a hard time believing that. They're not as hardy as their um, more common counterparts, but they're a lot easier to overwinter. One, gold, one fancy goldfish per 20 gallons is the general rule. They come in a lot of colors, varieties, and fancy finish. Super personable. I love them. And if you really get into goldfish, you could try your hand at spawning them. And goldfish are springtime spawners, and they will spawn throughout the summer for you if you feed them well. So here's some examples of goldfish that are bred to be seen from above in a pond. Um, one that isn't shown is the top view in Ranchu, and that was something bred by the Japanese. We also have here the butterfly tail telescope. Um, so. The main defining feature of this uh, breed of goldfish is that from above, the tail looks like a monarch butterfly, which is a really, really attractive thing. I appreciate it. It doesn't look as good from the side view in an aquarium, but they're often kept in an aquarium anyways, just because they don't do well in our winters. But they are kept outside in Japan. Um, another popular one is the celestial eye, and they were bred so their eyes point exactly upwards, so they're always looking at you when you're looking down at them in the pond. So, now I'm going to talk about some minnows. I kept two species of minnows outside this summer. I kept the fathead minnow, which is native to North America, and I kept the white cloud mountain minnow, which is native to certain areas of China, if I believe, if I remember right. Um, both these minnows can go down to about 5 degrees Celsius, which is pretty darn cold. Um, at that point, you know, ice starts to form, generally, or gets close to it. Um, fatheads are native to here, so they can actually overwinter really easily. So if you keep koi and you wanted to keep fathead minnows with them for whatever reason, you could. Um, this summer I started with seven fathead minnows. I had a population explosion, and I'm pretty sure my goldfish ate the majority of the fry. And I ended the summer with 15 to 20 adults and juveniles. And as for the white clouds, I started with 3 and ended the summer with 23. So my white clouds did really well as well. Both sets of minnows had a 100 gallon pond to themselves. Um, except for the fat heads, they um, were with 6 to 7 inch goldfish. And they somehow still managed to raise fry. So we're going to cover that really quickly. Like why, how could the fathead minnow still manage to have fry survive with big goldfish in there? Well, it's because of its unique spawning behavior. It actually spawns like that of a cichlid. Um, to trigger them to spawn, you have to have 12 hours of light, 12 hours of night. And the males will pick a cave, guard it, and protect their eggs from invaders. So I actually witnessed a 3-inch minnow fighting off two large goldfish from his cave, which was just a pot that he laid, uh, helped lay eggs and fertilize on the side of, which was crazy. He, he, did, a really, he did a really good job making sure those, those, all those eggs hatched and his babies made it. Um, yeah, and the males will often die after the, their first spawning, just because it takes a lot out of them um, defending their nest, and they tend to spawn throughout the entire summer. White Cloud Mountain Minnows are probably something you've actually heard of, and they're very popular fish, they're very colorful, um, they're actually ex they're extinct and s they're extirpated in the wild, they're extirpated in some areas of the wild, um, but they will spawn year-round, um, 
in most temperatures. I, I can't think of a time where it's too cold for them to not spawn. It's more of like as soon as they have eaten enough and they have a good food source, they'll spawn. Um, so you can actually get them to spawn indoors, it's just you don't get a huge fry survival. Um, you do a lot better outside. Uh, they're egg scatterers, they don't really predate on their fry very heavily, and with just a little bit of camp plant cover on the bottom and at the top, they will multiply very quickly for you. If you don't want to have too many at the end of the summer, I would start with a lower number, like maybe six, maybe seven minnows, and then you will get some decent schooling action and you won't have a ton of babies overwhelming you at the end. But even if they did overwhelm you and you had a ton, your local fish store will likely take them and so will people in your clubs. Um, and the cool thing I found out is in some places in the United States they have white cloud mountain minnow breeding races where they see who can breed the most white cloud mountain minnows in the summer. <sighs> I did not keep cherry shrimp outdoors, but I did. I do keep them indoors in an unheated tank. And what I've read is they can go down to 15 degrees. I've tested them down to 16. And I noticed my fancier variety, my Bloody Mary shrimp, tend to do really poorly down in colder temperatures. And I think that's due to the amount of inbreeding. But my blue and red really shrimp actually do fine at colder temperatures. And they seem to be continuing to breed um, even as low as like 18 degrees. Uh, much colder than, too much colder than that, and they don't seem to breed as quickly or as often, and you don't really notice any babies surviving. Um, and what I've learned over time is that invertebrates generally um, survive colder temperatures, and the best example I have of this is when it started getting really cold in um, November. I went for a walk along a river and decided to look under the ice flows and I actually saw a crayfish scuttling around looking for food. So the water was probably four degrees and that thing was still moving around doing its thing. The invertebrates are incredibly cold tolerant, unlike vertebrates. Which leads me to the pest snail. So I put my pest snails out when it was like five degrees at night and fifteen degrees during the day. I don't know why I did this. I was just trying to quickly cycle my pond and get it going so excited so I stuck a bunch of bladder snails and probably pond snails I don't really think I checked them I just took a bunch of pest snails and put them outside um, I do know that I put Malaysian trumpet snails out there and none of them survived as far as I know so they didn't do well with the cold but I put these snails out when it was decently warm and we had a cold snap and we, I actually ended up with ice over the pond and they still survived. So that was pretty impressive because you'd think they'd be a tropical pest snail. Um, and the snails were picked up by birds throughout the summer and they were picked up by the fish and they still managed to do really well. They were really prolific and really hardy. Uh, one of the species that people are most interested in when I talk about my But one thing I did note is when in the last week of August, when it got really cold, um, it, we had a nighttime temperature low of like 10 degrees, and I had them in a pond that was kind of in the shade, and their tub actually got down to like 10, 15 degrees-ish. And I didn't have any deaths whatsoever. I did have a female that came indoors with an infection. And I do I, I blame that on stress from temperature fluctuations rather than um, just the, the super cold night. Um, and then the final um, cooler water fish that I keep is weather loaches or dojo loaches. They're very, very active cold water fish. Um, I've personally kept mine down to 14 degrees C and they are still incredibly active and will eat multiple times a day. Um, what I've read online is they will go down to 10 degrees C just fine and actually, it's actually one of the key features that they, or key spawning triggers they need. That's why we haven't been able to um, spawn them in captivity all too often. But they have been kept and raised in ponds all across Asia and are actually a very common food source. They're super good tank mates for goldfish, especially fancy goldfish, just because they deal with the goldfish's nipping and 
like hustle and bustle that they do, it doesn't stress them out. And they do well with the cold water. And cool fact about weather loaches is they're one of the most, uh, they've been domesticated for a very long time, just like goldfish, uh, due to the fact that they can sense storms coming because of their sensitivity to barometric pressure. So, why should you keep cool water fish? I hope at this point I've convinced you, but I'm going to go over some of the main points here. You can save money on heaters and electricity. So with these fish, you don't need to have a heater on them. If you clear, if you're smart about it, both indoors and outdoors, you get to experience the fun summer adventure of summer tubbing. You can breed fish outdoors, including the hard to breed egg scatters like Daniels and White Cloud Mountain minnows and whatnot. You get to play with really hardy fish, and honestly, that's that's one of the really fun things I enjoy about this is you can mess up with these fish. You can go, oh, whoops, you know, <laughs> your tank got too cold, or oh, it got too warm, or you, maybe you miss a water change. And these fish just bounce back, they hold on. And that's why they're in the hobby. They're really hardy fish and they do well for beginners. They, they're very forgiving of rookie mistakes. And then, if you're anything like me, it reinvigorates your hobby. You, you're not bored with the same old, same old, and you spend your winter thinking about pond season and just looking forward to it and what you're going to do differently the next year because you have such a small window to like work with. So hopefully temperate water fish or subtropical fish are for you. If you have any questions feel free to ask them now um, or if you're watching this online feel free to drop the comments down below. If not, thank you very much for watching. And uh, see you next time.